All right, good morning again. Uh, it looks like the login rate has pretty much stabilized, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm David Cobb. I appreciate the um, opportunity to host this science communication webinar. Um, and uh, this is our October webinar. Uh, so with that, we'll get started. And again, I want to welcome uh, Lawrence Dorsey uh, for our October webinar. Lawrence is our uh, Piedmont Region Fisheries Research Coordinator. Uh, and the title of his presentation is The Changing Landscape of Black Bass Fisheries in North Carolina Reservoirs, The Story of the Alabama Bass. Uh, and with that, Lawrence, I'll let you take it over. Okay, hold on just a second, David. Um, my uh, PowerPoint here is, um, I appreciate everybody's time being here this morning. Um, this is a, a topic that I've been working on and others have been working on for several years. Um, some of you may be aware of the issue of Alabama bass uh, in our water bodies, particularly our reservoirs. Others of you may not. So uh, there's varying degrees of information in here. And hopefully by the end of this, uh, we'll have everybody uh, at least uh, more up to speed on the issue of Alabama bass in North Carolina uh, reservoirs. So before I begin, uh, I am the person giving this presentation today, but I would be remiss in not acknowledging uh, the rest of our staff that's been working on this. Um, this, that's a list of, of folks there across the mountain region, uh, fishery staff and part of the Piedmont that uh, probably not by choice did, did they uh, have to work on the species, but, but they have been working on this issue, collecting data and a lot of the information I'll present today, uh, I've garnered from them either through data that they provided or just informal conversations. So again, I'd like to thank all those staff members uh, that work with me uh, on this issue and, and continue to work uh, on this on this issue. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Duke Energy. Um, many of us in the aquatics and, and some of us on the wildlife side work with Duke Energy quite a bit. Uh, this is particularly true in my case over the years. I work with them a lot. Um, they're very good at sharing their data that they collect as part of their compliance work. Um, you'll see some of that data throughout this presentation um, and again, uh, they do a good job of, of sharing information with us and helping us uh, with our management. So you'll hear me potentially say use the term black bass um, in this uh, talk a few times and to explain what black bass are. Uh, there are more species that are on on this particular slide um, uh, throughout the United States, but really in North Carolina, the four that are native to this state, uh, every, Pretty much everyone's familiar with largemouth bass, likely smallmouth bass they're familiar with. Um, there are spotted bass that are native to North Carolina, particularly in the western part of the state in the Tennessee drainage um, uh, reservoirs out that way and water bodies out that way. And then there's a little bit of a, an influence of red eye bass in the far southwestern part of the state. But those are the four main black bass species uh, that are in North Carolina that are native. Uh, but the newest player to that game is the Alabama bass, uh, which is shown below. And the Alabama bass uh, is not native to any, any river drainage in the state of North Carolina. So Alabama bass, and it's, it's Micropterus hengeli for those of you that are in genetics. Um, it's native to the May Mobile Bay drainage systems in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Uh, up until 2008, it was considered a subspecies, um, and in fact, uh, you still, even on the fishery side, even, even myself sometimes will slip up and refer to them as spotted bass. Uh, they're very similar in appearance to spotted bass, Micropterus punctulatus, which I just mentioned is native, but they are a distinct species, and in 2008, they were categorized as such and have been moving forward. So when you look at, at the, the range of, of Alabama bass, um, you uh, that, uh, that this area here is, is the native range. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Mobile Bay drainage systems that touch the uh, northwest part of Georgia into a wide swath of Alabama and then just to the eastern side of Mississippi uh, draining down here. But the yellow is the, the introduced range of this fish. Um, and I didn't do a, a, a calculation of area, but you can see just visually that the introduced range is almost as large, if not larger, than the, uh, than the native range. Um, and that introduced range now goes into uh, East Tennessee, uh, 
goes across Georgia here into the northern part of South Carolina and then across a wide swath of the western part of North Carolina. And then this little sliver here, this is the Roanoke system, uh, particularly Lake Gaston. Um, so again, and this range unfortunately continues to expand. Um, a slide that I used previously that was provided by USGS uh, did not have the range uh, as uh, as being what it is now, and uh, and and it's 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 uh, continues to expand, unfortunately. So something we're, we continue to track with other states. So focusing in on North Carolina and our reservoirs, um, just to orient you, the red are systems that we have confirmed through genetics work with Auburn University contain Alabama bass. Uh, the orange uh, reservoirs are reservoirs that have spotted, and I use that in quotes, spotted bass. Again, um, visually, they're very tough to, di to distinguish, so we have to use genetics. Um, so we we suppose that most, if not all, these reservoirs actually with the orange on them, these fish are Alabama bass, but we're withholding um, our uh, determination until we get our genetics work back. And then, and what you'll see from that is that the Catawba Basin is very affected by this this introduction uh, out into the west, the, the, the Little Tennessee uh, drainage is, is very much affected. And then we have a few pockets here and there, uh, Belize Lake uh, up, up here uh, on the Dan River system. And then again, we haven't confirmed this yet, hope to in the next year, but, but Lake Gas on the Roanoke. Um, in green, I've highlighted three reservoirs that uh, I guess we informally refer to as the Triangle Reservoirs. Uh, that's Falls Lake, Jordan Lake, and Sharon Harris Lake. Uh, currently, those reservoirs don't have any documented uh, findings of Alabama bass in them, and we'd like to keep it that way. Um, the reason those lakes are important is they are probably five to ten of our, our best bass fishing, largemouth bass fishing lakes across the state. Um, there are also a number of reservoirs, smaller reservoirs here in District 5, that so far we haven't gotten any uh, confirmed cases of, of Alabama bass, and again, we'd like to keep it that way. So. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I have a feeling as we continue to do our genetics work over time that those orange uh, reservoirs, those orange water bodies will uh, eventually turn to red. Um, and there's also a lot of work going on in the mountains that are beginning to go on looking at some of our streams that either feed into these reservoirs or are between these reservoirs. And, uh, and I'm sure that, again, unfortunately, this, this map is going to build more and more into the red and more uh, the, the, the situations where we find what we, what we think are Alabama bass are going to be confirmed as Alabama bass. So looking at a focus case, um, this is Lake Norman. Um, if you've been familiar with the, the fisheries side of the house here in the Wildlife Commission, um, our agency spent a lot of time over the last 30 to 40 years working on Lake Norman, various uh, species, various issues there. Uh, but unfortunately, it's probably the epicenter of Alabama bass in North Carolina. Uh, 1962, the reservoir was formed when the Catawba River was impounded. Um, and by 1975, so just 13 years later, uh, I had a documented case in my files when I was a District 6 fisheries biologist of a meeting that occurred uh, between largemouth bass anglers and Wildlife Commission staff over poor largemouth fishing. And I think this stemmed from uh, the sort of the inherent issue that we've faced for years and years at Lake Norman, and then it's a very large water body. It's the largest uh, reservoir solely contained in the state, but it functions very differently than anglers expect. So in other words, their expectation is for a high quality, high productivity fishery. And because of the uh, nutrient inputs into that reservoir, uh, it just doesn't function that way. So only 13 years after the reservoir formed, there were complaints about it, uh, about the largemouth bass fishing, and, and we began to hear it. And by 1985, the Wildlife Commission was asked to stock spotted bass, and although I can't confirm that it was the intent was Alabama spotted bass, it's it's likely that that was the case. What were known to be Alabama spotted bass at that time, so we wrote a white paper on that. A staff member did, and we decided not to stock spotted bass. So fast forward to 2000, uh, Duke Energy was out doing some compliance work on, on one of their power stations, and they found the first Alabama bass, what we what we now know as Alabama bass. At the time, uh, it, was, it was classified as a spotted bass. And by 2004, we had the state record spotted bass, and again, likely an Alabama uh, bass that was caught out of the reservoir. Um, in 2009, there had been some, some work done by Jason Godbout, a student at NC State, 
looking at hybridization between largemouth bass and Alabama bass. I'll, I'll throw that in there as an issue that crept up early on and one that we see early on in the introduction introduction phase of these, these fish into reservoirs, but one that does not appear over time to be a major issue. That is the hybridization of largemouth bass and Alabama bass. Definitely talk about hybridization uh, between Alabama bass and other species here in just a few minutes. In 2015, after kind of batting it back and forth as to whether these fish were spotted bass, Micropterus punctulatus, or Alabama bass, Micropterus hinchuli, I was able to collect uh, 50 largemouth bass from a tournament, or excuse me, spotted bass from a tournament uh, at Lake Norman and send them off to Auburn University. And the confirmation came back that these in fact were Alabama bass. So that sort of set the stage for what we've know what we've suspected for a while, but, but what we now know is that in fact, the, the invader in Lake Norman is actually, or actually Alabama bass. So the question you have to ask is why Alabama bass? Why is that something that, that anglers would be interested in? And I think this picture says a lot. This is an angler from, the, uh, from a reservoir in their native range that's holding up two really nice um, Alabama bass. And, and in their native range, they do, for their, for their length, um, they never get to, to very large sizes in terms of length but their girth can be uh, pretty large for a fish of their size in their native range. And so anglers see that, they, they, they go and fish these reservoirs and they, they think, well, if I just pick this species up and I move it somewhere else, I'm gonna get that same level of response in these reservoirs. And as we all know, uh, that are deal with science and are deal with invasive species, that, that doesn't always hold true. And it certainly hasn't held true uh, over the vast majority of the systems that they've been introduced into North Carolina. But I think that's the initial interest is seeing a fish that uh, potentially in their minds could do better in these reservoirs, uh, but ultimately has not shown to do that. And I'll, I'll sort of demonstrate that here through the next few slides. So again, I mentioned Duke Energy shares a lot of data with us. Uh, they do uh, annual electrofishing surveys out on Lake Norman as part of their compliance work. They've been doing that annually since 1993, with the exception of 1999, when uh, they had some budget constraints and weren't allowed to go out and sample. Um, the x-axis is just the year, and so you'll see that time series up until just this past year. Um, and then this, the y-axis here is just catch per unit effort, and that's just the number of fish they're out catching on average. And so, um, Obviously, before 2001, uh, there were no Alabama bass documented in the system. It was all largemouth bass. But here, as I mentioned, you see in 2001, you see those Alabama bass begin to show up in their surveys. And really, the critical year in this time series is 2005. You'll see these two lines, the red and the black uh, lines uh, cross, and they diverge and they never come back together again. And at that point, Alabama bass took off uh, like a rocket in the population, and their levels have stayed fairly high ever since, and largemouth bass numbers uh, have stayed at, at low levels uh, ever since that time as well, and there's been that, that, that constant gap there, even with the oscillations in the Alabama bass data. So I, I, I stole this concept a little bit from my colleague, Ken Hodges. Um, this is another way to think about sort of the goal uh, at times that, that People think if I put a new species in a reservoir, that I'm gonna, it's going to be an additive effect. In other words, I'm going to have more bass, more black bass uh, total in the reservoir than if uh, I just have left largemouth bass in the reservoir. And again, the red line is 2001, and you'll see to the left of that line, that was all largemouth at that particular time, no Alabamas. And then obviously from then on, it's been the total number of out or the catch per unit effort of Alabama bass plus the catch per unit effort of largemouth bass. And really, except for this 2010 time frame when Alabama bass were in their initial invasion phase and were uh, increasing in numbers, you'll see that the numbers relatively stay the same uh, over time. There's oscillations, but there's always going to be that in wild fish populations, just like wild uh, wildlife populations, terrestrial wildlife populations. So, the take home message here is really that the total number of bass in the reservoir has not increased. Uh, what you've had is a compensatory effect uh, where the reservoir can only hold so many black bass and, uh, and that's what it's doing. It's functioning kind of the way we would, we would think it would ecologically. 
so another way to look at this is, well, you know, did did things, you know, what what did we get when we got these Alabama bass? Did we get a, a quote unquote a better bass? Again, if you remember that picture, well, those were two pretty plump fish for their for their length. Um, again, the time series across the bottom, but the metric here is relative weight. And the easiest way to explain relative weight is if you take take a fish, it's it's the relationship between a fish's length and their weight. So if you take two fish that are the same length. Uh, one of them is skinny and one of them is, is very fat, the fatter fish is going to have a higher relative weight score. Uh, the perfect score is 100. Anything above that is considered exceptional. Anything below that, not. Really what we see in our wild populations is anything averaging a 90 or better is, is pretty good. Uh, again, I mentioned Lake Norman is a nutrient challenge system, so we really wouldn't expect to see high relative weights for our largemouth bass out there. But again, when we get to the to Alabama bass, what we're seeing is a fish that's that's cycling between 75 and 80 on the relative weight scale. So for the most part, these fish are not fat like in the, the picture that I showed. They're they're fairly skinny for their length. Um, the largemouth bass typically do better um, in this system, and you can see relative weights have kind of been on a little bit of an uptick uh, since their introduction and. Really, if, if there is any difference there, it can be attributed to the fact that there's just less of those largemouth bass out there. So the forage they're going after, they're, they're, there's more, there's the same amount of forage for less fish that are out there. Um, but, but in general, uh, the replacement with Alabama bass hasn't resulted in a better fish. It's resulted in a fish that's actually uh, about the same or, or less in terms of quality uh, when it comes to relative weight. So taking this back out and scaling it back up to the entire state, uh, really what we've seen uh, over time has been uh, two different uh, impacts that have been on our, our black bass fisheries in North Carolina. Uh, the first is competition, direct competition with largemouth. And we just saw that uh, in the Lake Norman slides where we don't have any other black bass species in the reservoir. And then the second uh, issue has been genetic mixing with smallmouth bass and spotted bass. I really won't talk about genetic mixing with native spotted bass, but I'm going to talk a, a fair bit about uh, smallmouth bass. And as I also mentioned earlier, we do see a little bit of mixing with largemouth bass, but that tends to be fairly, fairly uh, insignificant and fairly early in these invasion timelines. So really the, the, the main emphasis that you'll see is, is with smallmouth bass. So Belize Lake, again, I mentioned uh, up uh, it's a tributary of the Dan River. It's up in District 7 in Stokes County uh, for the most part. Um, and uh, this is Ken Hodges' data, District 7 biologist. Uh, you can see Ken started his uh, time series in 2007. Uh, didn't see any large, or Alabama bass for several years. And then in 2014, lo and behold, he starts picking up Alabama bass. Um, and, I, and I call these Alabamas because just last year we were able to confirm through our genetics work that these are in fact Alabamas. So um, that's a, a new development. Uh, it's one of those lakes again that was at one point in that orange category where we thought it was Alabama bass but weren't sure, now we are. 2017, you see those lines cross like, like you did at Lake Norman and then by 2019, a complete reversal. Um, Alabama bass densities, catch per unit effort is much higher than largemouth bass. So again, we'll have to track this over time, um, but if Lake Norman is any indication, we'll see a fairly similar pattern on our graphs going forward. Um, not something that we're excited about, but but something that we're prepared to, to see there. Uh, maybe a little bit of hope uh, in this scenario. Again, Ken Hodges data of Lake Hickory, uh, which is some in District 8, so some in District 7. Uh, District 7 fishery staff covers this reservoir. Uh, this lake hasn't been confirmed yet uh, through genetics work. Uh, we haven't gotten the samples in yet to confirm that these are, in fact, Alabamas. But given its proximity to Lake Norman, likely are Alabama bass. But again, Ken's been sampling consistently since 2004. Uh, no Alabama bass or spotted bass, excuse me, in the system until 2012. And really has not seen that uptick there. Um, and no real explanation at this point as to why. But we are... It, it is a positive development that maybe Alabama bass don't function the same in all reservoirs when they're uh, introduced. So a little bit of dichotomy here between that and Belize Lake, maybe in a good way, but again, still trying to figure out why there, those differences do exist. Um, 
So I've kind of hinted about hinted on this a little bit um, in, in several of the things I've said talking about genetics. Uh, one of the projects we have concurrently going is a statewide black bass genetics project that's coordinated by Scott Loftus, who's my colleague in the mountain region. Um, really what it involves is a systematic sampling of black bass populations across the state of North Carolina. That's in all districts, all, all river basins. And we're really running two different kinds of tests. We're running a, a large test on all largemouth bass that determines if they're Florida bass or, or, or just northern largemouth bass. Um, and then secondly, we're, we're all black bass species that we get, we are doing a genetic makeup by species. So in other words, if we get a fish in the field that we believe is an Alabama bass, we'll send a fin clip off and it'll confirm whether or not it is a pure Alabama bass or it is some kind of hybrid. Same for smallmouth bass. Um, and in some systems, largemouth bass, we're doing that. And that gives us an idea of one, are we are we getting these fish right when we see them in the field? But two, um, is what we think they are, what they really are. So we're, we're collecting 50 fish uh, per water body, per recommendations, of Auburn University. And Dr. Eric Peatman down there is our uh, contact that's been working on this for us. Uh, we just finished up year three due to COVID. I think we're going to probably extend that that sample or that survey a little bit more um, and continue to do that work. So again, as I mentioned earlier, that, that map is probably going to change as we get these water bodies sampled and we get the results back. That's what's driving our determinations on these map on the map I showed earlier. Just to give you a couple of snapshots of what we've seen, this is Fontana Reservoir out in District 9. Um, and these are fish that were field identified as smallmouth bass by district staff on the, uh, out on the boat. And then genetic fin clips or fin clips taken for genetic analysis and sent off to Auburn University. And unfortunately, what we see is that 76% of those field identified uh, smallmouth bass were in fact a cross between Alabama bass and smallmouth bass. Uh, and only 24% of those fish were, were actually pure smallmouth bass. Uh, Fontana is one of the earlier uh, cases that we're aware of of Alabama bass being out in the western part of the state, according to Scott Loftus. So it's 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 very it's down the road a little bit more than some of our other systems in terms of timeline for the introduction of Alabama bass. Uh, moving over to the Catawba Basin, Lake James, which Scott tells tells me is somewhere between around 10 years after the fact, uh, based on their perception of, of when Alabama bass got into the system. Um, and again, we see that 65% of the fish that were field identified as smallmouth uh, actually were smallmouth, but that number of, of crosses, that 33%, uh, is, is starting to creep up. Um, while it's not in a, a Fontana situation yet, um, it's headed in that direction. And again, we continue to monitor these lakes to see over time if this changes, but this isn't a good indication for smallmouth bass in either one of these systems. What do these fish look like? Um, they're commonly called uh, by, in, in just in general terms, mean mouth, because they really have the the, the fighting characteristics uh, of, of both smallmouth and Alabama bass, which are pretty aggressive when it comes to, to the angling side of it. But if you're familiar with, with uh, these species, you'll see some characteristics such as some of the stripes in the jaw, some of the position of the, the eye versus the jaw, and then um, you'll actually see these these dotted lines in the fish that are indications of Alabama bass. So uh, eventually over time, and what we've seen in other systems that have outside of North Carolina that have had Alabama bass introduced for a lot of time, is these fish, these, these hybrids will eventually go away uh, over time. And what you'll see is a population that's almost dominated exclusively by Alabama bass. So you won't have spotted bass and you won't have spotted bass, Alabama bass hybrids you'll just have Alabama bass. Now, the timeline for that to happen varies by reservoir. Um, just like anything else with an introduced species, there's no uh, guarantees as to when and how long it will take for that to happen. But that's the direction that these systems are moving in right now. So, so what can be done? Um, about 15 years ago, uh, for some other reasons, the Wildlife Commission went ahead and codified uh, rules to to uh, prohibit the movement of fish in public waters. Those are just very difficult rules to enforce. Our enforcement staff does a great job. Uh, they're aware of these rules. They look for these things, but it only takes a couple of fish, uh, one time, one place to, to start uh, an invasion. And so it's very difficult to regulate the situation. 
Um, as fisheries managers, one of the tools we, we always have available uh, in any kind of fisheries management situation as a potential is stocking. And uh, but but realistically, we're not going to be able to stock our way out of this, given the the, the propensity of Alabama bass to, to start in these systems and maintain, ex maintain and expand their populations over time. So uh, really the best case we can hope for is that we will uh, be able to stock genetically pure smallmouth bass populations. Um, it's my understanding that the state of Georgia is already doing this in some of their northwest Georgia reservoirs that have had Alabama bass introductions into them. Um, and so likely we're looking at that scenario and I know our mountain region staff and our hatchery staffs are already kind of exploring those options and what the what the potential there is going to be. Um, and as with anything, really, at this point, you know, we go to the, the, the last bullet is education. Uh, we want anglers to understand the potential ramifications really of stocking any fish, but in this case, Alabama bass, particularly our bass anglers, because there is a mixed opinion among anglers out there as to uh, what they feel about spotted, excuse me, Alabama bass. I keep referring to them as spotted bass, but, but Alabama bass in our remaining uh, water bodies. Uh, some anglers like Alabama bass, some don't. But the, the bottom line is, is that most of the ramifications we've seen have not been good to the populations in these systems. So, you know, in the past, we've issued press releases. We've, we've um, tried to put stuff out on the web at times, but uh, this is an article that Bassmaster.com did a few months ago. Uh, Scott Loftus and I were both interviewed uh, in this article along with biologists from Tennessee. Uh, and I believe uh, Georgia as well, and talking about Alabama bass and the impacts that have happened, and again, trying to target those those anglers that uh, fish for black bass in our systems and might be interested or might think that uh, Alabama bass are, are, are a great thing uh, to try to point out some of those negative impacts to them. Uh, we've been on podcasts. Corey Oakley, who's my supervisor, has been on Fishing for Real podcast. Um, Nick Shaver, when he was in the R3, Angler R3 position earlier this year, went on the Let's Talk Fish podcast. Uh, these seem to be one of the new and emerging methods to get uh, our word out to anglers. Uh, there's a lot of participation on these. It seems to be uh, as good or better a medium than print media. Um, anglers listen to these while they're out fishing. They listen to them in their truck while they're going back and forth to the lake or at home when they're prepping their gear. And uh, in general, podcasts in general, of course, have, have gotten very popular, but they're particularly popular with anglers. Um, I'd put a plug in here that if there's any work that any of you are doing, uh, that there's a podcast that ties into that work, that you reach out to the, the host of that podcast and, and tell them you'd like to come on. Uh, most of the time they're looking for content and they're very willing to do that. We're going to continue doing this. We're going to continue to seek out um, additional opportunities on podcasts to try to talk to anglers and tell them just what we're seeing and what we're finding, particularly with, with Alabama bass. Uh, this is a multi-state issue, and I kind of hinted on this earlier. Um, this is a, a page that Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources um, has just um, put together on Alabama bass. They're very concerned about Alabama bass. Uh, they have some reservoirs that have smallmouth bass in them, but if you, if you know anything about Virginia, their bread and butter smallmouth or water is the new river system just an excellent smallmouth fishery. And, and they're very concerned given that uh, Alabama bass in North Carolina and in Tennessee are not very far from these drainages. Um, I think eventually or in the short term, very short term, we're gonna need to start getting together with some of these other states and collaborating a little bit, similar to what other states have done with CWD, um, things like that, uh, getting affected states together and talking about the issues, sharing data, sharing notes, sharing strategies. Um, it's not a, just a North Carolina issue. Um, it's, it is, it is as I said, at least four states right now that are dealing with it. And there's potentially more down the road, uh, depending on how far uh, these fish are being transferred uh, outside of their native range. So with that, um, I'll be glad to take any questions you might have and, and we can discuss you know, any, any issues you wanna bring up about Alabama bass. And again, thank you for your time. All right, thanks, Lawrence. Uh, has anybody got any questions for Lawrence?
Well, you obviously hit hit it exactly on on point. Um, so so I, I I have one for you. Sure. This this whole issue of Alabama Vass seems to me to be to have multiple elements to it. One is just the management of the fishery itself. One, as you mentioned, is the 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 fishermen, the you know the fishing public. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems to me like in some of the reservoirs, it could be an issue of of habitat potentially. And then interestingly to me, you also mentioned the potential genetic impl implications for uh, places, for example, that have uh, really high quality smallmouth fisheries. Mm -hmm. So um, it seems an interesting challenge challenge to balance all those. And so out of the competing interest, which in your opinion is, is most, most important? So I'm not, which the competing interest in terms of what, I guess I'm not following you. In, quite. in, in, in terms of managing, managing the fishery, managing the habitat, managing oh. the constituency, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think. You know, as, as scientists, we always want to go to the, the science side of the house and things that we're comfortable with. Um, that would be managing fisheries. That would be potentially managing habitat. Although I'd say with Alabama bass, they're very much a habitat generalist. I think there are some habitats that they don't particularly like. Um, for instance, if you had a lake that had a lot of aquatic macrophytes in it, um, and I'm talking about pretty substantial coverages such as mill ponds and things like that, um, they don't seem to, to gravitate towards that. Uh, but I would say that um, that uh, really it's going to be challenging managing the anglers. Um, a lot of these fisheries now, you know, the horse is sort of out of the barn and we're left to kind of pick up the pieces um, in, in, and figure out where we go next. But but really it's protecting what's left. And 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 it's through talking to anglers and educating them that, you know, leave these fish where they are. But don't put them in a system where they're not. You know, you know this, but but anytime you introduce something into a new system, it's there's there's no real guarantee or roadmap as to what's going to happen. I mean, over time, as we see these introductions, we're sort of building a knowledge base as to what things look like as we go along. But um, but you know that's not still not a tried and true recipe. And um, and so yeah, I think it's really more dealing with anglers um, because, as I said, it's very difficult to catch anyone introducing these fish. So, all right, um, here's another question for you: Do you think one driver of the invasion may be uh, that we lack any of the species that would be a better competitor with Alabama bass that are present in the native range but not located outside of it? So repeat that one more time. Do you think one driver of the invasion may be that we that we don't have any sure. of the species that would be a better competitor with Alabama bass that are in its historic range but don't occur here? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know so much that that's the case. Um, it, I, I didn't bring this in because it's it's a big it's a bigger there's a bigger picture issue here. In that, in the southeast, particularly in Alabama and Georgia, um, there's a lot of uh, endemic species, endemic black bass species in the streams and rivers down there, like shoal bass, swanee bass, uh, Chattahoochee bass, kind of go on and on on that list. And the one driver that seems to be messing everything up is Alabama bass. Um, so when they get in the system, they begin to hybridize with just about anything. And like I said, largemouth bass seem to be the one that at least over time they don't have as big an impact on but but all these other uh black bass species are, are very affected by them um, i'm not sure why they're able to out compete uh and, and hybridize with other species outside of their native range as well as they do um, but but they definitely do and what the difference is between their native range and here that, that makes them so as i said so easily adaptable i'm not really sure but definitely have seen it in multiple states and multiple systems and with multiple species so it's a there's a, there's a very layered effect here so hopefully i answered that yeah i think you did anybody else have any questions for lawrence 
I don't see any more in the uh, in the box, Lawrence. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call it and uh, sure. thank you again for being here. Um, I, I I've seen you or heard you talk about Alabama bass now between commission meetings and the webinar here a number of different ways uh, and a number of different times, and it's a really interesting topic and one that I think is is high priority for our agency. So I appreciate your your willingness to come and uh, share it with everybody else. Yeah, like I said, I just reiterate, there's a lot of us working on this right now. Um, if you're not in my area and you bump into any of our staff, uh, particularly in the mountain region, uh, they're all tuned into this because they're dealing with it. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things, it's one of those challenges that we get handed to us that maybe we didn't want, uh, but we're going to have to deal with, um, as you mentioned, and it is a priority for the agency uh, because, yeah, there are some fisheries. There's a lot of fisheries being impacted now, potential for impact to others. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity again to be here today and everybody participating. All right. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, everybody else is still online. And uh, we're going to have these uh, every second Tuesday of the month. Uh, and we've already got topics lined up through January. So uh, uh, hang out and come back to see us next time. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, thank you, David. Take care. All right, bye.